Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all here on this um, beautiful autumn day. So uh, <clears throat> during the past three weeks or so, we've been taking a little trip through the beat writers and their relationship to Buddhism in America. Well, we talked about Philip Whalen and Gary Snyder, Allen Ginsberg. And we talked about their impatience with the culture they found, the culture they found as they were growing up, coming of age. The post-war suburban, the V8, too much chrome, shiny, how to win friends and influence people, culture. So a dominant strain is, is that of rejection. But they weren't all negative by any means. They were wanting to savor life. And in various ways, um, they were all drawn to a greater or lesser degree to Buddhism like ants to honey. Buddhism had been popularized to a certain extent during the early part of the 20th century by various scholars, D.T. Suzuki, and then the very popular Helen Watts, others. who helped to bring uh, Buddhism more into the mainstream, although it was still considered exotic, and that might have been part of the attraction. But I believe the beat writers, in some measure, considered Buddhism to be an antidote to the hypocrisy and denial that they perceived in their culture. Buddhism being founded on a frank, honest appraisal of what human life is like. So I, I didn't want to end uh, the discussion of these poets without um, at least one more personality, and that is um, Diane de Prima. Some of you may be familiar with her. So Diane de Prima uh, started on the East Coast and ended on the West Coast. But she was born in Brooklyn in 1934 to a um, working class, second generation Italian family. Her grandfather had been um, a political activist in Italy, uh, an anarchist, and that may have accounted for why he needed to leave and come to the United States. But in any case, she had some of that in her blood. Uh, she was a good student, um, actually excelled in school. And uh, after spending a short time in a community college, she um, was accepted to Swarthmore, a fairly selective school outside of Philadelphia. And uh, she only lasted there for three semesters. Uh, because she was drawn 
to uh, the street life in Greenwich Village and um, left, left college to join the various people there. Became familiar with some of the other people we've discussed with Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs and hung out with them. Probably, probably every parent's nightmare for their daughter, but um, that's what she chose to do. And lived a bohemian life in the village. She, um, with another poet, um, founded a, a magazine there, um, sort of a low budget magazine um, called Floating Bear, which published many of the beat poets' early works, including her own. Uh, she wrote um, prolifically throughout her life. And um, I guess in the, it was in the late 60s that she uh, became disgruntled with what was going on in New York and went to San Francisco in 1968, I believe. Uh, along with a number of her friends, what she described as her tribe. And uh, um, stayed in San Francisco. San Francisco was her main home base uh, for the remainder of her life. Uh, she died just last year in 2020. So this is... Um, Portraits of um, Diane de Prima, various stages of her life. She continued to publish poetry uh, all the way up until she died. So, um, I guess the and to familiarize, well, one, one aspect I didn't mention is that uh, she was involved with Allen Ginsberg and another poet, uh, Anne Waldman, in the uh, co-founding of the Jack Kerouac uh, School of Disembodied Poetics at uh, Naropa University, uh, close to the time of Naropa's founding in, in the mid 70s. Um, and um, she actually held a, a teaching position there for close to 25 years. And, and I guess what I would like to do to, I guess, familiarize yourself, some, yourself somewhat with her work is to read portions of a lecture she gave on John Keats. And I do this, <clears throat> I was attracted to this because um, she gives... Um, quotes uh, from John Keats's letters. Uh, he, he wrote many, many letters throughout his life. His short life, by the way, he lived uh, only until he was 25 and died of uh, tuberculosis. But um, uh, the quotes that she selects are intriguing and also uh, her commentary on them. I think is is revealing. So this is, I mean, it's about three pages. It's a little long, I'm sorry, but I think it's all worth reading. So this is from a lecture she gave at uh, Naropa. There is a growing system of thought that Keat, Keats is evolving, but systematizing it would be simplistic. It would do him an injustice. As he said, I have never yet been able to perceive how anything can be known for truth by consecutive reasoning. I want to take the quotes and look at them, follow him chronologically through the process. So this first quote is from December 22nd, uh, 1817. Keats lived around the time of Beethoven, by the way. Um, the excellence of every art is its intensity, 
capable of making all disagreeables evaporate from their being in close relationship with beauty and truth. Several things dovetailed in my mind, and at once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature, and which Shakespeare possessed so enormously. I mean, negative capability. That is, when a person is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Coleridge, for instance, would let go by a fine, isolated, versimil, vers, <laughs> I knew I was going to stumble on this, uh, vers, verisimilitude caught from the penetralium of mystery. Verisimilitude, um, something that appears true or real. Penetralium is like the inner sanctum. So uh, would go by a fine, isolated verisimilitude caught from the penetralium of mystery from being incapable of remaining content with half knowledge. This pursued through volumes would perhaps take us no further than this, that with a great poet, the sense of beauty overcomes every other consideration or rather obliterates all consideration. So uh, to Prima comments, so at this point, what he's calling a sense of beauty, what obliterates all consideration or all thinking process is that same experience that we have whenever it all drops away, a kind of satori. My friend Katagiri Roshi, who's a Zen master in Minneapolis, gave six le lectures once on the word, wow. Wow, as the complete American Zen experience. When it all drops away, when the sense of beauty obliterates all consideration or the sense of the overwhelmingness of it. Wow, that's all we said for the last three days, me and my two friends as we drove here from California through all this incredible country. And we kept saying, they were asleep one night and I'm driving and saying, Wow, wow. Negative capability. Now you see how that idea, first of the man of genius not partaking of any particular character, becomes a bigger or more universal idea, which is that idea of negative capability of not pursuing any viewpoint. It's kind of an Eastern idea except that it happened fresh from nothing at this point in this kid in some dumpy English suburb. When a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. And to get to that state, clearly enough focus to make it the matter of poetry so that you don't try to make sense, but become this receiving tube, become this focusing point. Next quote, May 3rd, 1818. An extensive knowledge is needed to thinking people. It takes away the heat and fever and helps by widening speculation to ease the burden of the mystery. The difference of high sensations with and without knowledge appears to me this. The latter case, we are falling continually 10,000 fathoms deep and being blown up again without wings with all the horror of a bare-shouldered creature. In the former case, our shoulders are fledged and we go through the same air and space without fear. 
de Prima comments, the weight he talks about, or the way he talks about knowledge, there is almost a Buddhist sense of knowledge. We might use the term prajna or wisdom. Without knowledge, high sensations give us just that sense of falling. There's no way to simply allow it, allow them to occur, unless we can allow what Keats calls sensation with that negative capability. You'll never get out of where you are in the first place, never pierce the veils. A Buddhist statement, really, or agnostic one, in the full sense of gnosis. Knowledge eases the burden of the mystery. October 9th, 1818. Poetry must work out its own salvation in a person. It cannot be matured by law and precept, but by sensation and watchfulness in itself. That which is creative must create itself. That which is creative must create itself. This is an attempt to describe the workings of the creative imagination, De Prima says. That thing which spins itself out of itself, experienced also in meditation, sensation and watchfulness. I think you can see here that poetry was for Keats, can be for us, a complete practice, a form of what Suzuki Roshi called way-seeking mind, leading us to knowledge. The creative creates itself. And then October 27th, 1818, as to the poetical character itself, it is not itself, it has no self. It is everything and nothing, it has no character. It enjoys light and shade. It lives in gusto, be it foul or fair, high or low, rich or poor, mean or elevated. It has as much delight in conceiving an Iago as an Imogen, Iago being a, a villain in a, one of Shakespeare's plays and Imogen being a uh, heroine. What shocks the virtuous philosopher delights the chameleon poet. A poet is the most unpoetical of anything in existence because he has no identity. He is continually informing and filling some other body, the sun, the moon, the sea, and men and women who are creatures of impulse are poetical and have about them an unchangeable attribute. The poet has none, no identity. He is certainly the most unpoetical of all God's creatures. It is a wretched thing to confess, but it is a very fact that not one word I ever utter can be taken for granted as an opinion growing out of my identical nature. How can it when I have no nature? When I am in a room with people, if I ever am free from speculating on creations of my own brain, then not myself goes home to myself. But the identity of everyone in the room begins to press upon me so that I am in a very, in a very little time annihilated. Not only among men and women, it would be the same in a nursery of children. De Prima comments, this, I believe, is where he is most insistent, tries to come to terms with having no nature. The open space in which the poem occurs, that theme, not myself, goes home to myself, you know, but the identity of every creature harks back to that earlier passage I read about the man of genius having no individual character as opposed to what Keats calls the egocentrical sublime. Only now, a year later, he much more urgently tries to get in there and explore, talk about that open space. Maybe it would have been better if Buddhism had come to England because he would have had some mechanisms for dealing with that loss of self. He might have had techniques 
for being that person of genius and remaining centered so that maybe he wouldn't have gotten so sick. So in, in this lecture and in, in other writings, I think too, I think the beat writers were trying to relate these ideas they found so attractive in Buddhism and these practices they found so attractive in Buddhism to the culture they grew up with. In this case, uh, Diane de Prima trying to relate the writings of John Keats who I'm sure she had heard about in high school to her Buddhist practice. So I think that brings up the question, how do we, I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I think I can, I think I can safely say that all of us have weren't born into Buddhism. So we've arrived at it at some point in our lives and we're drawn to it. But how do we relate it to the rest of the culture? How do we weave it in? I think that was one thing that the beat poets were trying to do sometimes clumsily, but you can't really argue that they weren't sincere and persistent. I'd, I'd like to, to finish just with one uh, short poem of Diane de Prima. Uh, along the way, she managed, to, um, she managed to have five children with various fathers. And when she was pregnant with her first child, she composed this poem. <clears throat> Song for Baby O, Unborn. Sweetheart, when you break through, you'll find a poet here, not quite what one would choose. I won't promise you'll never go hungry, or that you won't be sad on this gutted breaking globe. But I can show you, baby, enough to love to break your heart forever. So both the love and the heartache. So I think we'll stop there. And um, um, break up into groups and um, maybe discuss some of the things that might have resonated with you, maybe some connections you've made east and west. Uh, the culture you grew up with and the Buddhist teachings. Um, and uh, we'll divide into a couple groups and, and then uh, uh, get back together in a few minutes. <clears throat>